Okie dokie. Here we go with episode 5 of Liam Small Reads A History of Newfoundland by D.W. Prowse. 20 pages at a time until the bars reopen. Whether I or you like it or not, I'm going to admit... Today I was very close to taking a skip day. And there might be a skip day in the future. Um, but, because, uh, I mean... Let's face it, this book, <laughs> this quarantine is going to go on longer than this series. So, like, I don't think we're in any danger. Um, so, forgive me at any point if uh, if I do miss a day or something. I've been having a little bit of trouble uh, with uploading and shit like that. So, you know what I mean? Bear with me. But, uh, like I said, I've said it a couple times. You guys have really held my feet to the fire on this. And every morning now I wake up dreading the 20 pages of work that lay ahead of me. Um, okay, so, getting right into it. Uh, last we left off, we were on page 80, and, uh, the, la the last thing we talked about was the Spanish fishing fleet being destroyed. Um, we really stuck it to them, and then the last going off, the, it was like the Spanish fishing fleet never, uh, sort of returned to Newfoundland or whatever, so the, the English really gave them a run for their money. No, oh, god damn, she's gone out. Well, that'll be it for that episode. Uh, <laughs> and I'm gone. Uh, okay, so, beginning uh, on page uh, 80 and 81, basically we get into um, a little bit more about Queen Mary, and D.W. goes into, like, I mean, he gets into, it, like, more or less Queen Mary the... F or not Queen Mary. Um, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth the first. Uh, not, Queen Mary was around for, like, five years. She, uh, I don't know, that short reign. Um, I was in Mun for longer than that. Um, but anyway, so Queen Elizabeth, uh, gets something going, and she was, like, a fucking G. Um, DW says that, like, given the difficulties in communications in those days, I mean, people are, you know, it's all, you know, fucking, like, carrier pigeon and messengers and stuff like that. But given the amount of, like, floods, pirates, robbers, any number of things that could have intercepted, uh, a message or otherwise interrupted the flow of information, um, given all of that, it's really impressive how, um how well-developed and well-informed uh, Queen Elizabeth was in terms of her intelligence department and stuff like that. It's really, uh, wasn't something I was expecting to hear, but I think that's pretty cool. Um, and it says, uh, in those days, yeah, Robertson, it's kind of remarkable how well-informed she was. Her intelligence department was like second to none, and the book actually quotes how cleverly and boldly she played the game against Philip, uh, the King of Spain at the time. Um, so moving on from there. So Elizabeth, she was, she was calculated and, uh, and, and, the, and her going up against the Spanish basically was, it was like no rash undertaking. That's what they say. I don't use the words like rash and undertaking. Um, but she, they give a lot of credit to her. Like go up against the Spanish at that time was like, wasn't no small task. Right. Um, and I just have a quote on the top page 81 here. It says, yeah, no rash, reckless undertaking. It was settled policy based, as I've just said before, in knowledge most varied and intimate upon true position to Spain. So she just like was amazing. And it says, uh, out of this great conflict with the colossal power of Philip, England emerged as not only the conqueror, but a mistress of the seas, a true genius of the English people had found its occupation, which is a really firm way of saying like, English is, uh, like, England is on the map. They are now sort of the power to stand up the Spanish who were, like, you know, like, super powerful at the time. Um, all well and good. Um, uh, and, yeah, so basically, all said and done, I mean, more or less, Queen Elizabeth kicked ass. Uh, there were two to three hundred Spanish vessels in Newfoundland during Henry the Seventh and the Eighth's reigns. Um, and then about only 150 during Elizabeth's reign. So she kind of, like, really had an impact on dwindling the Spanish presence in Newfoundland at the time. Um, I don't know, it just says, uh, then at the end of the successful war, the Spanish England got to, got, uh, England got complete control of the transatlantic cod fishery and the great Newfoundland Spanish fleet never came back again. The French and the Biscayans, however, stayed around, you know, for a little while longer after that, but the Spanish were kind of like, Ew, we're done. Um, from here, we talk about we get into like a specific year, um, something here that we stumbled on, it was, is it 1588 was called the year of the Armada, and I think that's when the sort of the big clash, like the rumble from the outsiders, you know what I mean, like the greasers and stuff like that, so the, the year of the Armada in 1588, the, the, in, in reference to the Spanish Armada, I think, um, so from there on, from 1588, year of the Armada, until around 1630, 
the English basically retained the Newfoundland fishery like as their own with almost like no rival, any sort of shit like that. Like they were the sort of the, you know, the, the big dog there. Um, and by, and by this time the English naval fleet in, in, entirely, uh, would nearly double that of anybody else's. So like when we talked about England really, you know, a couple of episodes ago, but really wanting to invest in shipbuilding and stuff and become, you know, the king of the sea and stuff like that, they really, they really went for it. We're starting to see that really come to fruition now. Um, yes, by some fucking fleet on ya, right? What do you got? A few boats on the go. Uh, so yeah, fifteen eighty eight is called the Year of the Armada, uh, which is the big old battle between the English and the Spanish. Uh, and it, and it, we we talk lots uh, about how strong the English ships were at this time. Remember from the help of the Italian shipbuilders in the boys in Devonshire. Um, so that was that was really good. We talk about, yeah. So I've just got a note here. We talk lots about the English ships at this time and. Oh, this is fun. This is fun, yeah. So, Prowse, in the book, talks about a guy named Prowse who used to be, like, an old seafarer or whatever, or a shipbuilder or something like that. And here he says, and Prowse says, there was a man named Prowse who was a gentleman in, 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 the, in the Battle of the Armada or whatever, 1588 or whatever. He was involved and states that he was no doubt a Devonshire man. And fucking there we have it, folks. I knew... I knew it from the first time he started stroking off the town of Devonshire. I was like, D.W. Prowse's family, he's definitely from Devonshire. There's no way he gives this much cred to a fucking town without his family being from it. And there, I'm, I'm so glad it only took the first hundred pages. I knew I was like, Prowse is from Devonshire for sure. And there we have it. So he comes from the descendants of the shipbuilders in Devonshire and he's none too ashamed to uh, get into that. That. So fucking there we are, mystery solved. I knew it. Okay, yeah, back into history and stuff. Um, okay, so um, West Country Lordship, the defeat of the Armada, blah blah. blah. So yeah, the defeat of the Spanish Armada left England basically. Once that once that happened, the English opened over the Spanish. They kicked their ass. They kind of got them out of Newfoundland. And after that, England was sort of the supreme mistress of the seas. Um, and you know, it was like a big flex for England, you know, now to be doing this because now England, because of their control of the waters and stuff. They had way more free trade from, like, the Mediterranean, the Indies, uh, spice, sugar, everything nice, uh, all that sort of stuff. And, and now colonization, we're going to see, we're going to see colonization start really ramping up and getting a bit more on the go. Uh, so in, in, when we're talking about colonization, oh, this is fun. Uh, wait now, just a quick, uh, yeah, so, and, and DW also mentions that in, in terms of colonization, so we've been talking a lot about Newfoundland colonization and stuff like this, but we know that in the Americas, colonization is also going to happen around this time. But uh, Prowse mentions that while the pilgrims and characters of American lore get the credit for early colonization, these events, everything we've been talking about, a century before the Mayflower are not getting sort of the credit that they, they deserve. You know what I mean? Like we all talk about the pilgrims and landing at Plymouth Rock and stuff like that. It's like, yes, it's all good. Like, yeah, yeah, a bunch of you, like, English Puritans landed in, like, you know, over there. Like, like, we've been on the go here already for quite some time. I don't know why you guys are getting all the limelight about it. Like, there's other people who had a lot more to do with what you had. What, you had a cornucopia or a fucking, like, what, you had a squash to share with somebody? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, we all know how the Thanksgiving story goes, how well all that fucking shit turned out. Um, yada, yada, yada. Um, so it doesn't get the quote because they deserve it. I have a quote here um, about that. Um, In the whole eventful history of English adventure, there are no events more remarkable than the dotty deeds of these Devon men who for 150 years kept this colony for England and ruled over the thousands of foreign fishermen who restored, uh, resorted to the island. These consequences, the consequences of these, of this early dominion were widespread. It has colored the whole of our history. And that really, um, you know, he really, he really wants to give credit to the guys who stayed here. Right. And, uh, and he does mention that in, um, you know, in sort of in these times that like, it's it's important that you know like I said why why aren't these stories being told the same way and he asked sort of the same question at the end when he says uh, there's a note about how after Queen Elizabeth died the Newfoundlanders maintained the colony and defended it for England and then DW asks us kind of like how things were so fragile at the time if the French had defeated us if the Spanish had defeated us if the Portuguese had gone, so I mean for for Elizabeth to go up against Spain at the time if Spain had won and Spain had taken Newfoundland things might have been different if the French or sorry if the French had taken Newfoundland um, you know and he has a quote here that just says. 
If once France had possessed the island with her 20,000 hardy fishermen, she would have held the key to North America. And with her sea and land forces, the colonies would have ceased to exist as independent communities. And things would have been way different, right? So he's just asking, like, you know, at any, at any point, really, during this time, like, the, the seas have changed, you know what I mean? Like, we could have easily been owned by the French or been Spanish or, you know, things could have been very, very different. We could always speak in, you know, Spanish right now, you know? Um, so anyway, that does take us to the end of chapter four. We get an appendix and the appendix is filled with, uh, I don't know, it's just like uh, charters and licenses and policies and uh, I'm not getting into it. So uh, we're going to skip right over that. Uh, we get into, okay, so chapter five is the reign of King James the first. And again, like the last chapter, I had a few important dates I kind of wanted to mention during his reign, which was 1603 to 1625. Uh, during that time, we have in 1605, 250 English ships in Newfoundland, according to Sir J. Child, uh, fish sold at 8S per 100, I don't know, units, shillings, probably. Uh, Henry Hudson's third voyage. Uh, so this is a, a, number, a marking of a number of how many ships, uh, English ships were in Newfoundland at the time. Uh, we have 1608, Foundation of Guy's Company. We're going to talk about Guy's Company in a little bit. Guy had a lot to do with the colonization of the island. Uh, 1609, Sir George Summers and others wrecked at Bermuda, which I was just like, oh, so the Bermuda Triangle was on the go even back then. Cool, good to know that uh, holding strong. 1612, fun date, because uh, it's, it's a note of Peter Easton, pirate in Newfoundland. So that's around when he was hanging out. Um, and there's some other notes about that date, but... He's a pretty famous pirate, so cool to know when he was here. Uh, 1619, Great Fire in Conception Bay. 5,000 acres burnt maliciously by fishermen. And, which sounds weird. Why would the fishermen be burning something? Like that? And that is sort of something we're going to end uh, this episode on. So we, it's something that's going to happen down the road. These dates all sprawl the greater portion of uh, King James I reign. So then we're going to kind of step back again, like I mentioned, and kind of work our way up to that. Uh, in 1620, there were great disturbances in St. John's Petty Harbor between the English and Portuguese commissioned to Mason to take up ships to suppress piracy, landing of Pilgrim Fathers. In 1620, this is in uh, the States there. Publication of Mason's book on Newfoundland and other written uh, documentation of things that were going on in Newfoundland at the time. Uh, 1623, the first account of cargo fish sent to Newfoundland to, from Newfoundland to Virginia. Baltimore's charter. So this is uh, we've got a we've got a real firm connect. We've got a written documentation of trade going on between Newfoundland and Virginia, which had been the settled colonies over there at the time, stating that they existed. Um, super cool. So the beginning of this and the beginning yeah, of of his reign of James' reign is sort of the real mark of the British expansion and colonization, like. It started with the Henrys. They were get they were stoked about it. Then Elizabeth was in, and she sort of ramped up things, like got it going. And then James was on the go. And really, when you think about the difference between King James the First and Henry Henry the Seventh and the Eighth, it's only like a hundred years. It's really like three generations. And this sort of stuff takes time when you consider how long it takes even to fucking get across the Atlantic Ocean. You know what I mean? So now, King James the First is sort of really continuing in the tradition of uh, the colonization spirit that was forefronted by seventh, eighth, the Elizabeth, Mary, not so much, but you know, and in, in that tradition. Um, okay. So in this, I've got a quote on page, uh, 87 where it says here, or it's saying what I basically just said, the early part of this reign marks the commencement of the colonization period in English history. Um, and then I have here, uh, the calendar of St. Paper, uh, the calendar of state papers at the beginning of the century is full of applications from all sorts of uh, conditions of adventurers claiming to be the fortunate discoverers of new islands and territories teeming with gold and valuable commodities. The craze of the 17th century was colonization. Um, so that's just again to say that now, now everybody wants to get on board this sort of really get in like almost like the, when you think about the gold rush it's like the fish rush you know what i mean because now people in the 16, like the 1600s or the 17th century are like really starting now we're now we're wanting to go over right and then another quote here that says uh from this period dates the foundation of our great american colonies the creation of uh french dominion in america the formation of new france in lacadie uh, in 1607 the london company made the first settlement in virginia at jamestown new england first known as north virginia was brought into notice by the successful voyages of gosnold uh Berberton and archer uh 1602 followed by martin pring 1603 weymouth uh 1605 popham Ra and Raleigh gilbert settlement uh, at the mouth of Kennebec in 1607. These are all place names. Uh, they're all named after people, but they're all uh, settlement names. Uh, and uh, celebrated Captain John Smith's adventure in 1614. So these are all some of the early settlement names. Um, 
in New England at that time. Uh, so all of these settlements, so, so the point being, uh, so we're bringing up all those settlements, is that um, all those small American settlements at the time, which we consider like the first in North America, they all fucking paled in comparison to what was going on in Newfoundland at the time, given the amount of ships, the action, the trade, like the global trade that was happening there. Like these small ports in, in what was, you know, early New England really, it was nothing. Like it's like, it's like barely even worth talking about, right? Um... You know, uh, at this time, it's worth mentioning, at the same time, um, while all this was going on, the expansion is, they're still constantly looking over their shoulder for Spain, still a very powerful, um, you know, country at this time, and, you know, on the water and stuff, um, you know, uh, and, and, and likewise, Spain was always looking over their shoulder, because even though they'd suffered some losses to the English or whatever, they were just kind of waiting for the English to fuck up, right? And sort of even after... Uh, remember our buddy Rally? There's, you know, Rally. Um, so after Rally died, even like the Spanish started trying to attempt to claim or say that the Americas almost maybe, and it's arguable, but like maybe almost right up to Newfoundland were actually part of their domain or whatever. And this, you know, of course led to some dispute, right? <laughs> it's like, no, boss, it's not yours, it's ours, right? And they, you know, so they, they, they're talking about maybe even Bermuda belonged to them. So there were still claims as to who actually um, held rights to the territories in the New World. Um, and dude, and DW throws some shade at the pilgrims too, going back to like how much credit they get for like being there at the early start of this, so forget the Spanish again. He jumps around a lot. Um, but when you go back to the early pilgrims, my next one is, yeah, DW just gets like, he's got no time for the pilgrim stories. Like, why the fuck are we talking about like these pilgrims? Like they're some sort of fucking like brave adventurers when it was like 150 years after we first got there and you guys like got Charlie Brown Christmas specials after you or like whatever the fuck, right? He's just like... He really kind of, this, I feel like this sticks with uh, DW. I feel like the more I read, I'm learning more about our man DW here. Um, yeah, so, but now, now to their credit, he do, DW does mention that because the first pilgrims were so Puritan and they were so, like, English and so forth, they, they weren't long forming their own sort of governments in these settlements, um, sort of almost, but, like, almost quicker than we did. You know what I mean? It was a different style of colonization. These guys were going there, they were... They weren't hardened fishermen at the time, so a lot of a lot, it, was, it was just noting some differences between the way that they colonized and the way that we did. Um, he gives credit, uh, and he credits the fishery with giving prosperity to New England, the colonies. You know, they started for the same reason we did, the the Atlantic shore, um, and but the way that they did it, and the way that they were able to prosper, a lot of the techniques they learned from the shore fishery and stuff like that were things that were picked up in Newfoundland. So DW does give us credit for um, sort of training the buys on how to start America. Over there, yes, man. Yo, you guys take all the credit. That's no big deal, man. We don't, we don't get anything up here, man. That's cool. Um, okay, so yeah, New England got it from the U.S. Um, blah blah blah. Kind of going on here. Uh, into page ninety-one. Uh, yeah, yeah. It says here on ninety-one. Kind of back up. The spirit ancestors were just as loud in their claim to export free rum to Newfoundland. Uh, to send their refused fish to the West Indian Negroes to smuggle and defy British navigation laws, to trade with this ancient colony notwithstanding all restrictions, and to steal the Devonshire men's servants. Um, we so and that's the that's the New England sort of state of mind, you know, at the time. Um, I also have another quote here. Um, yeah, so they all made their living from fishing, and they sort of. Um, I'm just checking here again. They're, yeah, so Dito is basically saying that their history is interwoven with our own. Through trade, through whatever, obviously they, they wanted our skilled labor, we wanted some of theirs for different reasons, blah, blah, blah. There was like... It was like a healthy competition between the colonies. Like, you know, the better you looked, the better you were, and stuff like that. So back then, um, even though they were both from my England, there was still kind of, uh, you know, people wanting to be the better, better part of it. Um... Now, um, what we get in it, the next thing we get into here is it's so the second the second period of our colonial annals commences with the reign of James the first. Now we talked about James, so I mentioned him at the beginning uh, of the chapter here and stuff, and I mentioned a bunch of dates. Now, just because I this is King James doesn't mean he was good at it, and um, and whilst oftentimes in terms of Scottish lore, English or King James can be painted as uh like a really honest noble king that might just be because like <laughs> you get your head cut off if you didn't at the time but uh it's noted in, the, in, a, in a passage here 
the subtle all-pervading influences of art and poetry have shed such a halo of glory around these unfortunate sovereigns that neither the hard logic of facts nor time nor reason have been able to deaden nor destroy the almost universal sympathy for this picturesque dynasty, even for the slobbering, shuffling, uncouth pedant with his nameless vices, the first English Stuart, the most sag sagacious, high and mighty Prince James, there is still some sympathy. Uh, which he basically is saying, like, he doesn't deserve. <laughs> he, he, there was a lot of, like, he didn't listen to there's a lot of mistakes made and probably gets higher praise uh, than he deserves for um, what he actually achieved during his reign, which I'm not really entirely sure what all of that is, but there we go. Either way, ouch, fucking throwing shade at King James I long after he's dead. He's not even there to defend himself, D.W. Prowse. Come on, bye. Be nicer than that. Anyhow, um, but uh, King James noticed he, he loved, there was Chancellor Bacon, we mentioned Bacon before, um, and, and Bacon was a Newfoundland advocate, and... You know, he kind of was able to bend James's ear in his favor. James was the kind of monarch who listened to his buddies more than the reason and stuff like that, which is why, again, he led to a lot of his mistakes and stuff like that, you know, nepotism and that sort of thing. Um, but it, eventually James did start paying more attention to her colony because of what Bacon had said. And uh, apparently by way of royal charter company attempted to govern the island. The, <laughs> the island. Um, this is all following in Gilbert and Raleigh's steps, this, the same sort of things, establishment, the early government uh, of the place. So now we've got the king sort of taking more attention to it. Uh, D.W. calls this period between 1610 and 1711, the first time we've gotten out of the 1600s. Um, he calls this, so that period of 100 years, 1610 to 1711, uh, the fishing admiral period, because basically of the power that the fishing admirals uh, wielded on the island at the time, or or you, we could call this the colonization period, basically at the same time. Uh, so now we start talking about um, this fella Guy. I mentioned Guy a little bit before, and Guy was uh, uh, he, he was a fellow who he was he was a member of the government, stuff like that, and he came to St. John's and started to expand. He, he he began sort of the expansion of the colonization of the island, more or less. Um, I have a quote on page ninety three here. Um, uh, young Alderman John Guy is a striking personality, shrewd, pushing, energetic, and full of ambition. The company consisted of most of the men of light and leading in James's court. Bacon was undoubtedly the guiding spirit in the enterprise, while Guy and Robbero were the working members, so boots on the ground. So while the, the dreamers were Bacon and the king, Guy was the guy fucking... <laughs> guy was the guy doing it. Um, so he came down and started... Um, settling, you know, expanding the audience, we're getting into more CBS area, uh, those types of things. Um, I have a note here. Um, also, oh, I didn't come without convincing. Um, Guy's Colony was made up of some of the bigger characters at the time, which I just mentioned. Uh, but so, and, and a lot of the people who were impoverished, his, his shipmates and stuff were people, and people left with in his company were guys who were impoverished by members of Sir Humphrey Gilbert's voyage that was like not so great. And he got lost and stuff when all shit went down. So some of those fellas who survived it, um, now we're all kind of part of guys coming in again. This is all sort of around the same time, mid 1600s. Um, but anyway, the, the, you know, the, the king wasn't necessarily convinced at the time, you know, uh, so it took a little bit, took about three years or something to get, uh, King James to get things rolling, but, but they did. So to his credit, uh, anyway, there's a lot about guy and how he colonized a bunch of Newfoundland, but basically he did. Pardon me. Um, he planned it, he went for it, and this is what they wanted. This was the goal. Like, they wanted to colonize at this point. Um, you know, they, they planned commerce, they planned what they would trade. Um, the manufacturing, you think, like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. That's so many beers. So rude. Um, <laughs> uh, but they planned what they would manufacture, how they were going to manufacture it. You know, it was a real thought out strategy of expansion here on the island as a more permanent spot, especially for England, if England is going to end up, you know, going into the Americas and stuff like that. Perfect waypoint. Newfoundland always has been. Um, oh, cool. So this is where we talk about on page. Um, yeah, so I've sort of, I sort of breezed through it. There's a lot of this stuff about Guy's arrival. Um, and the expansion, the kind of, it's not really that important. But there is a cool note here about uh, Guy's arrival in Cupid's. So Cupid's is a little bit more buried, um, sort of inland, as you know, right in the water to get in there. So a lot of the people, even though it's salt water, it's still ocean water in Cupid's, they, they, were, they thought it was a, a useless place. Like they didn't think it would be anywhere where any trading, jibbing, fishing, any sort of shore, anything like that would happen. 
but you could get in there. So this is where Guy kind of set up like his fortress, like which I love. Um, yeah, he call, uh, he uh, <laughs> he started. Yeah, so he colonized with him, but yeah, in, in Cupid's was where he sort of settled. And on page uh, where ninety seven, yeah. So uh, get, getting to that point, I'll just say. At first, everything went well with the new colony. They had a remarkably fine passage out. In 23 days, they sighted their new home, the deep uh, Bay de Grave. Now, Porta Grave, uh, Conception Bay, the bottom of this uh, you know, estuary, lies a beautiful little landlocked harbor of Cupids. Uh, it was so far embayed that the resident fishermen, who were then sparsely scattered about Harbor Grace Carbonair at the bottom of the bay, had passed by this little sequestered nook as unsuitable for the fishery. The selection of the site for the new colony was a happy one. So this is where, and I, I love this, uh, yeah, at Cupid's, Guy built three houses besides his three wharfs, stores, and fishing establishment, a fort 98 feet wide and 120 feet long was enclosed by a strong stockade and a battery was mounted with three guns. On Southern River, they erected mills, houses, and farm buildings. A considerable quantity of land was cleared and surrounded by stone walls. So he really set up a firm fucking town. Um, and that, that is now modern day Cupid's, which is uh, pretty cool, I think. Um, little barricade. I mean, it all burnt down and got sent to hell over time. And there was some debate. Uh, I think the remains were found like years and years uh, later. And there was some debate whether this was Guy's Fortress or not. And I think that argument has been settled since. Also, remember, this book was written in 1895. So anything that may have changed, historically speaking, because people, I don't know, still do research. Um, I'm only catching up to like before cars were invented. You got to remember that shit. Like this ain't, you know what I mean? This is the history up until... Before we started using 19 when we break down the year. You know what I mean? So, you know, this is... Some stuff may have been updated and things like this. So we don't really know for sure who's what and what's which. But by this time in 1895, um, they weren't sure. And just the last note um, is where... Um, you know, there's, oh, there's a, there's a lovely quote here at the end before it gets nasty. It says, the, the alderman, uh, Guy, uh, the, uh, Guy, the alderman, was not the first settler nor the first Englishman to discover that Newfoundland, on the whole, was a very pleasant country to live in, which is nice. Um, and the, the note I'm going to leave you on, the next thing we're going to pick up with is, she says, soon after the formation of the colony, hostilities were commenced against the permanent settlers called planters by the Western adventurers. The ship fishermen from Devonshire. No doubt the proclamation of laws made by the alderman Guy, uh, governor, uh, on the 30th of August, 1611, roused their indignation. And I mentioned there at the beginning of the dates of King James I that uh, there was a bit of burning going on. 5,000 acres, or 5,000 acres, I think it was, or something like that. So, or square feet, square meters, I don't know. Um, anyway, so the burnings and uh, some revolt, I think, are going to happen in the next coming pages. I'm pretty excited to see how we stick it to the man. Anyway, guys, thank you for listening. This has been the fifth installment of Liam Small Reads A History of Newfoundland by D.W. Prowse, 20 pages at a time until the bars reopen. Oh, thank you for sticking around. I appreciate you guys um, listening, learning. Um, feedback has been cool. Um, please know that um, this is a burden. And um, oh my, what a pain in the hole this book is. I am uh, begrudgingly going through this while uh, killing time in quarantine. But what else is there to do, guys? Why not learn something, eh? Um, it's a hell of a lot easier than doing push-ups, as far as I'm concerned. Anyhow, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'll see you tomorrow, whatever. Stay healthy. Stay sane, boys. Wash your hands. Um, all the best to you. I hope you guys are coping well. And I just wanted to make another note. Something me and a roommate were talking about earlier today is uh, don't get lax. You know, we're, we're coping to this quarantine thing, but it's important that we, we keep up some of the habits we've been doing and don't let them... Fall by the wayside, guys. Um, don't get too relaxed. I know it sucks, but we're still early in this. We need to keep our habits going. Don't forget to wash your hands. Don't forget to sanitize stuff and stay, uh, you know, keep your six feet. Uh, be good to each other and uh, keep looking out for the guy next to you because maybe, you know, they're a little more compromised than you are. Um, love you all. Thanks so much. And uh, see you tomorrow. God, <laughs> I just fucking hate this.